is hard when we hear a beautiful performance today of Tchaikovsky's violin concerto, such as Heifetz's, to conceive of anyone hearing it for the first time, not immediately responding to its matchless grace. However, after its world premiere in Vienna in 1881, Hanslick, the noted musicologist and critic, wrote in the morning newspaper, for a while the concerto advances in customary fashion, is musical and not uninspired. Then crudity gains the upper hand and reigns to the end of the movement. The violin is no longer played, but torn apart, pounded black and blue, and raped. Whether it is actually possible to project these terrifying difficulties clearly, I do not know. But if it is possible, I can only be sure that our soloist, in trying to do so, brought martyrdom to us as well as to himself. The adagio, Hanslick continues, with its tender Slavic melancholy. calmed us again. But this breaks off suddenly, only to be succeeded by a finale that plunges us into the brutal, deplorable gaiety of a Russian holiday carousal. We see savages, he continues. Vulgar faces, hear coarse oaths, and smell vodka. Scathing words of that review, Tchaikovsky could quote verbatim to the end of his life. But that was not the only disappointment which Tchaikovsky received as a result of this, one of his gayest works. He dedicated the concerto to Leopold Auer, who, although he was only 33, was one of the leading violin virtuosi of the time. Auer asked the slightly older man to compose something especially for him. Tchaikovsky was most flattered by the invitation and in about six weeks presented Auer with a melancholy serenade for violin and orchestra, Opus 26. Although this piece is wistful and charming, it can rightfully be considered unimportant. And though Auer played it several times, it was never taken seriously. Tchaikovsky, who, as we shall see, was a very good critic of his own works, realized this and wished to present Auer with something truly worthy of him as a violinist as well as of Tchaikovsky as a composer.
three years later to the day, he put the finishing touches on the last movement of his violin concerto. <laughs> and sent it with all confidence to his Moscow publisher, Jurgensen, with the proviso that if it were to be put in print, the dedication should be to Leopold Auer. <laughs> Jurgensen, the publisher, immediately commenced making the plates of the finished work. So Tchaikovsky came to Auer, not with the manuscript, but with the engraved plates, so that even if Auer had wanted to make a few minor changes, it would have been difficult to do so. Tchaikovsky proceeded to play the work for him on the piano. We can only imagine this scene, the shy Tchaikovsky playing the piano in his self-admitted awkward way. The successful and cosmopolitan Auer curious about the new and enormous work, but dubious as a result of the inadequate presentation. It might have sounded something like this. Even the highly experienced hour could not, in his mind's ear, immediately translate the sound of that into the true sound. Tchaikovsky left the music with Auer, who promised to study the work and perform it as early as possible. Several things, besides the awkward presentation, may have put him off. There actually are no indications of the reasons that animated him, but whatever they were, Auer publicly let it be known that Tchaikovsky's new violin concerto, to quote his own words, in spite of its intrinsic value, calls for thorough revision since in parts it is quite unviolinistic. As an historic aside, it is interesting to note that although Auer was unwilling to play the D major concerto at the outset, he became its most outspoken champion in later years. Actually, it is Auer's interpretation of the work, immortalized first through his own careful edition, but more important, recreated through the performances of his great pupils, Zimbalist, Piastro, Elman, and Heifetz. It is this great tradition of performers and performances stemming directly back to Auer himself which has done more than anything to ensure a continuing audience for Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto. <laughs> Taking Hanslick's and Auer's first impressions of the work as a starting point, let us see how with the benefit of 80 years more musical perspective, we could answer them or justify them. In a less vitriolic portion of his review, Hanslick complained that the first movement of the concerto lacked essential variety because its two themes were both lyrical. This is the first theme as it first appears.
And this is the second theme as it first appears. Now, Hanslick probably felt, as did most musicians in the Romantic era, that one of the most important things in an extended work like the first movement of this concerto is contrast. And for him, contrast meant difference in character among the various themes of the work. But Tchaikovsky had a very good reason for making both of these themes lyrical. As you see, they are first announced by the solo violin and Tchaikovsky knew that the violin is essentially a singing instrument. He certainly had historical precedent for what he did. Listen to some music written for violin from the earliest days of it as a solo instrument, from the incomparable master of the capabilities of the violin, Johann Sebastian Bach. <laughs> and this from the great classical period of Mozart. even up through a German contemporary of Tchaikovsky, who was Hanslick's idol, Johannes Brahms. <laughs> Different as the character and style of those violin excerpts were, they had one thing in common, and that was that they sang, and so do Tchaikovsky's melodies in the first movement. What Hanslick failed to realize was that Tchaikovsky did achieve necessary variety and contrast by the dramatic placement of those two beautiful melodies, by what came before them, between them, and after them. Tchaikovsky was often a dramatist in writing works in extended form, but never more so than in this movement. He does not give away his secret immediately, but starts his concerto casually with the orchestra announcing a simple, unaffected tune. He seems to be saying, once upon a time, but what is this wisp of melody? growing excitement 
leads us to believe that it foretells of something important to come. Having reached its climax, the orchestra bows out and leaves the stage empty for the leading player, the solo violin. The soloist pays a slight homage to the orchestra's introductory theme, but much more important, prepares us for the main theme. Where could Hanslick find more drama and contrast than in that opening, all within the first 30 measures of the piece? Having chosen an equally lyrical theme for his second important motive, Tchaikovsky fills in the important space between the two themes with passages which show off another essential quality of the violin, its agility and flexibility. The violin is a small instrument its strings are close together, and it has a huge range from low G to high B, over four octaves. This makes it capable of all kinds of vast scales and arpeggios. throughout its wide range, as well as wide jumps and dramatic flourishes. Tchaikovsky takes advantage of these in the bridge between the first and second themes. The first theme ends with a sort of nonchalant curtsy. Tchaikovsky commences his bridge section quietly with a playful motive built out of that curtsy. Followed by delicate arpeggios. But soon the arpeggios get more exciting. Sudden brief outbursts of the orchestra are followed by angry scales of the soloist. Hear these exciting jumps. After a last brilliant flourish, the soloist's pyrotechnical displays relax and we are emotionally prepared for the beautiful second theme. violinistic agility utilized for dramatic and structural intent, as in the best tradition of concerti from Vivaldi and Bach to Mendelssohn and Brahms, and not simply for display purposes. that Tchaikovsky himself lavished on the concerto is revealed by the fact that he completely discarded a slow movement which he had originally composed and substituted another, the bittersweet canzonetta that we now know as the second movement.
we are in a position to examine why the original slow movement was abandoned and the present one substituted because Tchaikovsky preserved the original intact. He called it Meditation and published it as part of Opus 42. The entire opus was dedicated to his dear friend and patron, Madame von Meck, and was called Memories of a Loved Place. Let us listen in toto to the Meditation and try to understand why Tchaikovsky discarded it as a slow movement for the concerto.
This is a lovely lyrical piece with a real melodic character. The meditation fails as a middle movement in the concerto only because it is, in a sense, too complete in itself. Remember that its place in the whole work was to follow the brilliant ending of the first movement. <laughs> And it must also precede the gay Russian dance-like character of the last movement. <laughs> With the meditation in its original place, Tchaikovsky's concerto would have become a disconnected collection of three pieces of three different moods and characters, and the only binding element would be the fact that they all were written for violin and orchestra. Listen now to what Tchaikovsky achieves by the present slow movement, the canzonetta. Remember the end of the first movement, the soloist and orchestra together proudly affirming the tonic chord, that is, the key in which the movement was written. <laughs> Now notice how casually Tchaikovsky starts the next movement with the same chord. But slyly the orchestra moves away from the chord towards a new key. This short introduction with its lovely clarinet melody serves to establish the new home base, and when all is prepared, the solo violin enters with its melancholy, sweet song. At the close of the movement, the violin's song fades away, as Hanslick remarked in his review. But did Hanslick notice that Tchaikovsky, at the point of its fading away, reintroduces the orchestral introduction? But this time, the clarinet melody is not used to re-establish the key of the movement, but imperceptibly moves away to introduce a new tiny motive. Here. By constant repetition, Tchaikovsky tells us to pay attention to this melodic germ. It has, he seems to warn us, a significance much larger than its size. What will happen to it? Suddenly he stuns us with its importance. Now we see why Tchaikovsky discarded the earlier meditation, beautiful though it was, as a slow movement for the present concerto. 
for we see he has used the entire lovely consonetta as a subtle bridge between the two outside fast movements. For the first measure of that last movement is nothing more than a louder, livelier, and faster version of the tiny melodic germ at the end of the canzonetta. And as the finale progresses, Tchaikovsky continues with a quicker version of that germ, tossing it casually around among the various instruments of the orchestra. Suddenly the orchestra stops and the violin remains alone to give its own comments on that melodic fragment. Auer, in his edition, states that this entrance of the soloist must be played with all the freedom and abandon of a cadenza. The violin continues to play around with that fragment, apparently as aimlessly as a cat with a spool of thread. Until we realize that that little germ is the entire melodic basis of the main dance-like theme of the movement. Hanslick said that this movement plunges us into the brutal, deplorable gaiety of a Russian holiday carousal. To a degree, he was correct. That first theme certainly could be the musical accompaniment to a wild Russian trepak or pizatska. The second theme is slightly slower, with its monotonous droned bass. It has the character of a slower, slightly inebriated group dance. The dance measure gets more and more excited, as if the dancers themselves were becoming self-hypnotized by their own steps. The third theme has the sentimental quality of a folk song rather than a folk dance, but without losing the essential atmosphere of rustic Russian festivity. Far from being a fault, as Hanslick implied, this folk quality adds a distinct charm to Tchaikovsky's music as a whole. Tchaikovsky himself was well aware of this Russian element in his works. In a letter to Madame von Meck, he states, It is true that I often start to compose with the idea of using some popular song or other. Sometimes, however, I do this without intent and find the rhythms coming to me quite naturally. Let it be stated that I grew up in a quiet place and was drenched from earliest childhood with the wonderful characteristic beauty of the Russian folk song. So I am passionately devoted to every expression of the Russian spirit, gay or sad, nostalgic or devil may care. In short, I am a Russian through and through, in every sense of the word. And as
As we, in the 20th century, listen to this last dashing peroration in this cosmopolitan but completely Russian violin concerto, we can only find that Tchaikovsky showed himself much more perceptive than many of his critics. Thank you.